Hello everybody. This lecture will be about mitral stenosis. I am Dr. Ahmed Farid, consultant cardiology and fellow of European Association of Cardiovascular Imaging I'm from Suez Canal University, Egypt. So we first will start by reviewing the causes of the mitral stenosis. The mitral stenosis is mainly in up to 80 to 90 percent is caused by rheumatic affection of the mitral valve. This including a commercial fusion, leaflet thickening, cordial shortening and fusion, and calcification starting from the leaflet tips. The other causes of mitral stenosis will be either degenerative, uh, congenital, or others. The degenerative are like annular calcification and really the leaflet thickening and the calcification and starting at the base of the leaflet at the annulus. For the congenital causes, you have the subvalvular apparatus abnormalities, you have the parachute mitral valve, and you have the dull orifice mitral valve. There are some other rare causes of mitral stenosis, like the inflammatory uh, with SLE, the infiltrative diseases, carcinoid diseases if it extends to affect the left-sided valves, or maybe drug-induced. And this is and these are examples of uh, the mitral stenosis you can see on the left side this is the typical rheumatic affection um, in the middle this is the degenerative type of the mitral stenosis and this is the congenital which what's called the parachute mitral valve this is also another variety of the mitral stenosis that's due to occur to uh, of congenital anomaly it's a double orifice mitral valve so here, what's the role of echocardiography in mitral stenosis? You tell by this the etiology or the mechanism of the mitral stenosis. You define the severity of the mitral stenosis and you assess the severity of the associated regurgitation of the mitral valve itself and you make a decision regarding the coming therapy for such a lesion. We have a lot of methods for assessment of uh, mitral stenosis by echocardiography. This include the 2D planimetry, the pressure gradient, the pressure half time, the continuity equation for calculation of the mitral valve area, and we can use the PISA method, the M mode, or the 3D echocardiography. Start by the 2D planimetry. The 2D image show in mitral stenosis, it shows the leaflet thickening, the mobility is restricted, the commissural fusion, the calcification, the subvalvular apparatus, the cusp separation index, and spontaneous echo contrast within the left atrium. The first thing is you notice is the leaflet thickening, and the leaflets tend to be thickened at the edges, starting from the edges of the valve and going down to the annulus. And we define the significant stenosis over five millimeters at the tip of the valve, and should be assessed in diastole while the mitral valve is fully opened. And this is example of a classic mitral stenosis with thickened leaflet tips. And regarding the leaflet mobility, you have the systolic doming of the anterior metavalve leaflets in the parasitic longa axis, which is typically called the hockey stick sign, which is the most specific echo sign for the rheumatic affection of the mitral valve. You have also the fish mouse appearance of the mitral valve in the astole in the parasternal shoulder axis or you have the funnel shaped with complete loss of mobility in later stages of rheumatic mitral stenosis. And this images showing the fish mouse appearance from the short axis and showing on also the funnel shaped um, changes that occur in the advanced stages of rheumatic mitral stenosis. And this is the classic hockey stick sign that we are talking about. It's the restriction of mobility of the anterior mitral valve leaflet. You can also use the mitral valve leaflet separation index, which you measure the distance between the opening of the tips of the mitral valve. If you have less than 0.8 cm, this indicates severe mitral stenosis. If you have more than 1.2, indicates mild mitral stenosis or even no mitral stenosis. But it's not accurate in case of heavy calcification of post balloon mitral valve alveoloplasty. So it may give you a crude index of the severity of the mitral valve uh, stenosis. Regarding the planimetry, the planimetry is the direct tracing of the visualized mitral opening at the leaflet tips in the parsternal short axis view. And this is the least parameter affected by hemodynamics, loading conditions, and heart rate and concomitant mitral regurgitation. So it's relatively, you can consider it if you have a good image quality, this is the most accurate method for assessing the severity of the mitral stenosis. 
and it's the most reliable method to measure the mitral valve area immediately during balloon mitral valvuloplasty as all the other parameters in the hemodynamic parameters are affected immediately after the post balloon mitral valvuloplasty so this is the after the valvuloplasty this is the most accurate method for the assessment of the success of uh, the operation we have here some tips for performing a good planimetry Number one is put the mitral valve at the center of the sector in the parasternal longer axis view where the ultrasound beam is the strongest. Rotate the probe knob to get the short axis view. So starting from the parasternal longer axis and then rotate until you be at the tips of the mitral valve. Sweep up and down starting from the mid papillary muscle while you are in the parasternal short axis toward the base of the mitral annulus through the mitral valve until you get the leaflet tips which is the narrowest point of the area. So in the short axis, you are sweeping up and down until you get the narrowest area of the mitral valve. And this is example um, how you should take your measurement. You should put the mitral valve at the center of the image. You try to keep the tips of the leaflets at the center of the image in the parasternal lung, and then you rotate 90 degrees to get the short axis. Now you are almost at the tip of the mitral valve leaflets in the short axis, and you can start doing the planimetry. But be aware that just slight movement inside toward the, the left atrium or outside from the left ventricle, it can change the area dramatically while its shape is still to you. It's stenotic and it's still circular. So be aware of this. You should try as hard to get the narrowest area and be at the tips of the mitral valve. You should use your zoom method to be accurate and seeing the valve very clear and start to planimetry and the zoom images. You adjust your gain settings. You should avoid the overgain because the overgain usually underestimate the mitral valve area. And also you should not undergain the image as this will overestimate the area as you will have a lot of dropouts and you may trace these dropouts as included in the mitral valve area. So you have a higher valve area than what the patient is actually having. Also, you should perform several measurements if the patient have an atrial fibrillation or incomplete commissural fusion. So you should take, in the sinus rhythm, you should take like three measures and average them or take the narrowest of them. And the atrial fibrillation, you are taking five to ten beats even if the heart is frankly irregular. And if there is incomplete commercial fusion, you should take multiple measurements and take the narrowest or take the average of them. And you should trace the inner rim of the valve orifice including the opened commissure in mid-diastole with the valve fully open. Like these images. You start the mitral valve planimetry in the parasternal short axis view. You should perform zoom like the image B, and then you start the tracing like the image C, and you should include the opened commissures in your tracing. Also here, be note that this red arrows are pointing toward the commissures that should be included in your planimetry. This should be included in your planimetry. So you have some pitfalls in the planimetry, like if you setting your image gain too high or too low, as this may lead to some blooming. So this is underestimate the mitral valve area, or you may have dropouts, which may overestimate the area. You may have a bad window, so you are not able to see the mitral valve area or opening clearly. You have shadowing with severe calcification, and this is one of the problems. Um, it depends mainly on the operator skill. So the more experienced you are, the more accurate area you will get. Uh, if you have an even morphology, like one of the commissures is opened and the other commission is heavily calcified and closed, if after balloon mitral valvuloplasty, especially if the mitral valve had some tears, this uneven morphology may be a source of errors. And you better to take the measure three times, especially in patients with atrial fibrillation, you may take five up to ten beats or ten readings and then average them or take the narrowest of them. But the planimetry have a lot of advantages as it doesn't depend on flow condition as we had seen before. And it doesn't depend on chamber compliance, cardiac chamber compliance or other valvular lesions. So it is very accurate. But it's not feasible in poor window or in patient with severe calcification. Like the images we have seen here, you may miss one of the commissures during the tracing, which is considered one of the biggest fallacies in the planimetry. 
moving on to another method for assessment is the M mode. And the M mode on the mm, mitral valve leaflet tips in the patient with mitral stenosis may show you the degree of the excursion of the leaflets, it may show you the thickness of the leaflets, and may define the leaflet mobility. So you can see from the M mode that there is leaflet thickening. You have diastolic separation of the leaflets is decreased, and there is decreased diastolic EF slope. And you have also paradoxical anterior motion of the posterior mitral valve leaflet, which is considered one of the earliest signs of the rheumatic affection of the mitral valve, the paradoxical anterior motion of the posterior mitral leaflet, and you have an early diastolic depth of the interventricular septum. In this image, show all the findings that we had seen seen before. It has showed the leaflet thickening, the increase in the EF slope, decrease in the EF slope, and the cusp separation is reduced, anterior motion of the posterior mitral valve leaflet, and the septal depth in the, of the interventricular septum. Using the color for the assessment of mitral stenosis, the mitral stenosis has a very characteristic pattern of the candle flame appearance. So it appears like a candle flame starting from the tips of the mitral valve and extending toward the left atrium, toward the left ventricle in the apical four chamber and two chamber views. Now moving on to the pressure half time, um, which means the time interval for the maximum gradient to reach half of its value in diastole through the mitral valve. And you can calculate the mitral valve area using the pressure half time by dividing 220 over the pressure half time value that you get. And this is example how you should take your mitral valve and the pressure half time for calculation of the mitral valve area. You put one of the points at the top of the E wave and then you take the slope to be parallel or going over the slope of the drop of the pressure on your trace. But sometimes things are not easy. You have two slopes like the image here. So you have this initial fast drop and then a slower mid drop. Which one should you take? Should you take the yellow line or should you measure the red line? And actually, you should take the red line, the more steep slope that occurring in the mid diastole. This is more correlated to the mitral valve area. And there are some factors affecting the pressure of time. If you have, you may have the left atrial pressure decline, like in cases of ASD, as the left atrium is draining to a second chamber, not through the mitral valve only. You may have a stiff left atrium with left, low left atrial compliance. But and also, you may have the left ventricle pressure lies, like the patient who have significant aortic regurgitation, or you have a stiff left ventricle. These all these measures can affect the readings of the pressure of time. Moving on to measuring the pressure gradient or the mean diastolic pressure gradient, you use this in the apical windows. You have here the maximum and mean gradients and put this in the Bernoulli equation to get you the millimeter mercury conversion. And the heart rate should be mentioned with, me with this measurement because it's affected by the heart rate significantly. And you can consider that the heart rate over 80 start to affect the measures of the pressure across the mitral valve. So you take your measures and then you start the tracing from the beginning of the trace up to the top point of the trace and going over the trace until you reach down before the closure of the mitral valve. Okay. And according to the pressures that you get, the mean gradient that you get, you should classify the mitral stenosis into mild and moderate and severe. According to the area, you classify it, it's over 1.5, this is mild, it's from 1 to 1.5, that's moderate, and less than 1 is severe. And also you have the mean gradient, if you have a mean gradient less than 5, this is mild, from 5 to 10, this is moderate, and more than 10, this is severe. We have some other, we have some other measures to assess the mitral valve area, like using the continuity equation, and here you use the mitral slope volume, 
to calculate the mitral valve area. So the mitral valve area by the mitral valve VTI equaling the LVT area by the LVT VTI. So if you do the conversion, you can get the mitral valve area by using the LVT, LVT area by the LVT VTI over the mitral valve VTI. You can also use the PISA method for the assessment of the mitral valve area in patient with mitral stenosis, but be aware that in here you should um, include the angle of the mitral valve during the diastole as all the PISA method consider that the calculation is across a flat surface, which is not the case in the cases of the mitral stenosis. So you are taking all your parameters and adding them to the by um, the alpha over the 180, the alpha is the angle um, included of the mitral valve during the diastole. So you zoom on the area of the mitral valve from the apical forward chamber view. You're using the color flow imaging of the mitral stenosis jet, jet and adjust the aliasing velocity to 30 to 45, exactly like you are doing with the mitral regurgitation, but you shift your baseline up against the direction, not like in, in MR because it's the opposite direction. You freeze the color flow images in the cine loop, identify an optimal frame to measure the radius. So measuring the radius from the tip of the mitral valve to the end of the arc of the PISA and determine the angle between the two mitral leaflet tips at the atrial surface and they calculate the mitral valve area using the formula. So we can go to these more complex methods of assessment like using the continuity equation or the PISA if you have some factors that hinder you from using the traditional methods. As you, you can use the continuity equation in case of heavy calcification where the planimetry is difficult. Continuity equation cannot be used with significant AR or MR and PISA can be used with significant mitral regurgitation and aortic regurgitation. The next very important decision when you're doing echocardiography for a patient with a mitral stenosis is define the suitability for going to balloon mitral valvuloplasty or not. And you can define this by using either one of these three identified scores for scoring the mitral valve, like the Wilkins score, the Cormier score, or the commissural calcification score. But you start this scoring if you have the mitral regurgitation is moderate or less. If it is moder more than moderate, then you cannot proceed with balloon mitral valvuloplasty. So you are considering putting these scores if the mitral valve regurgitation in mitral regurg is one or two plus maximal. Over this, you cannot calculate the balloon mitral as this patient will not be suitable for balloon mitral valvuloplasty. So this is the Wilkins score. It depends on the four parameters, the mobility, the thickening, the cordial involvement, and the calcification. And this is the Cormier score, where it defined the patients into group one, group two, and group three. And this depends on the calcification, pliability, and the cordial affection, all in, uh, to put them in one group and the commissural calcification score, and this is very important, and this should be included in your assessment regularly with the Wilkins score, the commissural calcification score, because if you have the both commissures are closed and calcified, this tends even if you don't have a big calcium score or don't have a big Wilkins score, that when you're doing balloon mitral valvuloplasty, that the balloon will cut or tear the leaflet itself rather than the commissures. So the assessment of the commercial calcification is very important. So again, the pre-balloon mitral valvuloplasty evaluation will include assessing the mobility, the valve thickening, the calcification of the commissures, the subvalvular thickening, the calcification, the presence of thrombus, even and the left atrium itself by the transthoracic or the left atrial appendage by the transesophageal echocardiography, and this should be done before balloon mitral valvuloplasty. And also, you assess the tricuspid regurgitation and the pulmonary artery systolic pressure. You may also found some associated lesions like the quantification of the LA enlargement. The severity of aortic stenosis is underestimated, so you should be aware of this in patients with mitral stenosis. You may have aortic regurgitation, and also, if you have significant aortic regurgitation, you should know that your pressure half time is not valid. 
you should assess the severity of associated mitral regurgitation as we had seen before. You should assess the tricuspid regurgitation and the tricuspid annulus width as this may affect your decision even during surgery that the patient may have may need tricuspid valve repair. And you should assess the pulmonary artery systolic pressure. Sometimes you may need to perform stress echocardiography for patient with mitral stenosis if you have discrepancy between the calculated area and the patient's symptoms. So you have mild MS with symptoms, then you should put the patient to do a stress echocardiography using either the bicycle or the treadmill and not recommended the dubitamine, but you may need to use it if you don't have the previously available tools like the bicycle or the treadmill. So you use, and if you're using bicycle or treadmill, you measure the mitral and the mitral valve gradient, the diastolic gradient, and the tricuspid valve velocity and the pulmonary artery systolic pressure. So during the exercise, if you have the mean gradient over 15 millimeter mercury with exercise is considered a severe mitral stenosis. If you have a mean gradient more than 18 with dobutamine is considered severe mitral stenosis. But um, I can say that in patients with with dobutamine, they tend to develop arrhythmias and atrial fibrillation if it is not already in atrial fibrillation as this is very common in mitral stenosis so the use of dobutamine is not very common in patients with mitral stenosis and this is example how when you perform a stress echocardiography you starting by the resting TR velocity of 38 and then with the stress you're going to 88 so this is a significant increase in the palmar artery systolic pressure with exercise and you have the mean gradient for the mitral valve it was 5 and this with exercise is going to 13 millimeter mercury so there is increase in the gradients so you should go for this or should go for stress echocardiography in patient with mitral stenosis if you have a mild mitral stenosis and there's significant symptoms that is not correlated with the findings at rest and thank you.